All right. Is the lighting bad, guys? How's the lighting? Is this, I think, yeah, too bright? Okay. Let me turn around. Hold on. Yep. Sorry about that. Oh, this is even worse, huh? That's even worse, friend. Hold on, buddy. Hold on. Hold on. Don't let my bald sexiness. How about this way? Yeah, this is better. This is better. Can I ask you guys a question and be honest with me? I need you guys to be honest with me. As I get my health back, hey, 1611, on your way to heaven. Can I ask you guys a question and be honest, okay? Let's see. All right. I need you to be honest with me. Hold on. Why am I so handsome? Can you tell me? I mean, the one, I mean, before I couldn't stand looking at myself. Now I just can't get enough of myself. Look. Man, why am I so handsome? And being so good looking, I don't envision myself staying single for too long. I'm just the catch, you know what I'm saying? So I'm being humble. I think I'm just the best catch for any woman. Arr! No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Sorry, man, this shirt. Because I've lost weight, the shirt's falling off my neck. All right. Anyway, good to see you. Like I said, until I get my own place, which will be sooner than later in Jesus' name, I'm going to be doing live streams sporadically, meaning... I won't be able to have a set time because I'm at my brother's place. So pray for him and his wife for their graciousness and hosting me until I get my own place by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they just left because they left. I have about two hours. Doesn't mean I'm going to take two hours, but thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Definitely are handsome. That blesses my heart. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyway, so the, here I am and Lord Jesus willing. Here's what I like to do. If it's God's will for my life, if the Lord Jesus is pleased to continue to use me until the Lord returns or takes me home, what I like to do is continue writing articles, rebuttals for my blog, continue doing live streams, providing in-depth exegesis of the scriptures, going in-depth on the biblical foundation for the core doctrines of the Christian faith, taking the common objections by anti-Trinitarians and or anti-Christians against the authority of the scriptures and the core doctrines of the faith and provide thorough refutations of those objections by the grace of God's spirit. In fact, uh, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you guys. You need to go to my blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. I just finished my five-part series on demonstrating what Luke taught concerning the vicarious sacrifice the substitutionary atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a five-part series. I also came up with, <clears throat> I forgot how many rebuttals to Islam and Muhammad, but you guys got to constantly go to the blog because I'm constantly updating it, study the arguments, pass on the information and use it in your witness and glorifying Jesus Christ and exposing Islam. Duhawu. Why do you keep telling me CP will be live in an hour? Do you want to go there? Go. He's my brother in Christ. I have to come on when I can. So will you keep telling me he's going to be live in an hour? And? Okay, let's shut down. Guys, I'm going to shut down because Duhahu is telling me that CP is going to be on in an hour. Okay, guys, see ya. Why are you telling me? All right. So go to answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. I want to continue the series on demonstrating... The deity of Jesus Christ from what's called the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, as well as Acts, because the same author who wrote Luke wrote Acts. So by the grace of the child, as the Lord Jesus blesses the Internet connection to stay strong, glory, Lord, please bless this Internet connection and anoints me to speak truth. I'm going to show you that all four Gospels.
Okay. All four Gospels, starting with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which I'm going to start <clears throat> examining what those Gospels have to say, describe Jesus Christ either in his own words and or actions or what they say in respect to the words of Christ or his actions as Jehovah God of the Old Testament, that he's Jehovah God Almighty who became a flesh and blood human being distinct from the Father and the Holy Spirit. Is that clear? This is the best we have. The internet, this is the best we have because my brother doesn't have high-speed internet. So I'm not going to burden him and say, get it for me. Yeah. So is that clear? So usually we have about over 100, but these two days, like I said, I lose more people than I bring. Anyway, God's will be done. I pray he transforms me, crucifies my flesh, saves me from my weaknesses, imperfections, and my flesh. Fill me and everyone with fruit from the Spirit, life and power from the Holy Spirit to walk in the Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. So I don't be unnecessarily offensive, right? As you can tell, I, you know, I don't shy away from going for the jiggler. So let's trust that God will bring whomever he wants to listen. And let's pray the Lord Jesus will bless the YouTube channel so I get more subscribers, more like, so that more people get exposed to this information and use the information to glorify Jesus Christ, refute the attacks on the faith, and win people <clears throat> to Jesus Christ, right? Thank you, Ron. I'm glad. So, hey, Maureen Dahi, I just talked to your sister, Dahi. Exactly, Maureen, because I'm a handsome Jilu. Pray for me, Maureen. For that young woman. Pray for her, too, in Jesus' name. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, Andrew, sorry, man, that I missed you, but this is how it's going to be until I get my own place. So, But you can listen to the archive and then share your comments. Now, if you guys are ready, I want to begin in prayer by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we go into... Matthew and Luke's witness to Jesus being Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh. Because yesterday's session, I talked briefly about what Matthew said in <clears throat> relation to Jesus being God Almighty in the flesh, Jehovah of the Hebrew Scriptures. So I want to follow up on that, build upon that foundation until I'm done demonstrating from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Luke's companion volume, Acts, that Jesus is Jehovah God, Almighty in the flesh, and then segue into the Gospel of John and deal with the Gospel of John, what it has to say about Jesus being God, became flesh, the God-man, what it has to say about the Trinity and salvation and so forth and so on in Jesus' almighty name. Yeah. Did you notice this? You see this dog that came here, Tim Garrett? He had to take a shot because his father, the devil, was pricking him to take a shot. And he thinks he's actually rebuking me when all he's doing is exposing the demon that controls and possesses him and that he's a rabid dog. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. These dogs, I don't know. It's like they want attention. Yeah. Carl, go back and listen to the archive. Okay, you guys are – Hafsa, no, these are dogs. Remember Hafsa. You have wolves in sheep's clothing, filthy, wicked, rabid dogs, controlled of the devil, pretending to be Christian, coming to attack Christians because they can't do anything but attack because they don't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't get people saved. They don't know how to teach the word. So they're envious and full of hate and anger and jealousy. They're filthy, wicked dogs that will be silenced and muzzled by God Almighty. And yet... They don't understand that they don't bother me because it gives me an opportunity to then humiliate them. And see, I guess they don't learn the lesson, right? They think I'm going to, no, all you're going to do is give me an opportunity to muzzle you like the filthy dog you are, and I'll do it in love. I'll be very loving when I do it. Where's the love? Road, can you send Road out of here? Send him out of here, please. The road is long. Bye-bye. <whistles> All right. Uh, that's not my job, Ko Oko. 
that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And these people claim to be Christians already. So how are you going to bring them to Christ if they claim to be already following Jesus, Kooko? And send my friend Kooko on his merry way too. Like I said, my policy will be is I'm going to get rid of tears as fast as possible. Those who distract instead of contributing because I don't want to waste time anymore because then it upsets my brothers and sisters who are faithful, who do want to learn. So my apologies to every one of you, but I'm going to be quick now, right? Pray for me to be successful in getting rid of all these tears, nuisances, and obstacles and agents of the devil. Because I don't want to distract you. Is that right? You guys okay with that? Is that all right? Because I know it bothers you and it becomes a stumbling block to you who are here to learn with an open heart by the grace of God. So sorry about that. I'm going to try to be quick. People already know what the rules are. I've already stated over and over again in all these sessions what I expect from people who come here. And if you don't want to respect those rules, that means you want abuse of the devil to distract. And you're going to get muzzled and thrown off the page because I don't want you here. You know, I don't know. People, I don't know how much more clear I can make it. Okay. So with that said, <clears throat> Father, we love you. We praise you. We love and praise your son, the Lord Jesus. We love and praise your Holy Spirit. And Father, please, I ask that you save us from our flesh. Save me from my flesh. In those areas that grieve your spirit, save me and crucify my flesh. Give us power of your spirit to walk in the life of the spirit, to be filled with fruit of the spirit. And Father, please help me to be patient and not retaliate, but to trust in you as you are patient with us. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Anoint the session. Bless the internet connection. Grant me clarity of thought and speech. Save me from error and stammering and confusion to recall scripture perfectly and exegete it correctly for the glory and honor and praise of the Lord Jesus. Use this session to produce greater love and faith and trust and hope in the Lord Jesus to become more like the Lord Jesus, your beloved son. Surround us with a wall of fire from Holy Spirit. Surround my daughters with a wall of fire from Holy Spirit. Cover them, cover us with the blood of Jesus and cleanse us and purify us in the precious blood of Jesus. Fill my lungs, my chest, and throat with the breath of life, with health that I need to do this, Father. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. And, Father, bless this YouTube channel for your glory. You don't need me. We need you. Bless it, Lord. Bring more people who have open hearts to hear and to learn by the power of the Holy Spirit, Father. We love you. We praise you. We love your Son, the Lord Jesus. We love your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, have your way and guide the conversation for the glory of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yahweh Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh Father, Son, Spirit. All right. Hallelujah, Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh Father, Son, Spirit. Okay. I want to discuss again the Synoptic Gospels, particularly their testimony concerning Jesus Christ being Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh. Now, this is the third part in the series. And God willing, I will return. I will return, Lord willing, to my series on Jesus Christ. And the Archangel Michael demonstrating irrefutably from the sound interpretation of the scriptures that Jesus Christ cannot be the spirit creature called the Archangel Michael. Everything in due course in time. Pray for me to become more like Jesus in the way I live, the way I love, the way I worship, the way I serve. And that God will give me favor in this state and bless me abundantly. And there are some issues I just can't be public with. All right. But the Lord knows my needs and my desires. And to bless my children and bring them to me for his glory, for the glory of Jesus, right? So <clears throat> now why is it important to demonstrate that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts proclaim that Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh? Why is that important? Because it is common among liberal, critical, biblical scholars. And it's common among Muslims. This is a common objection raised by all of them that the earliest strains of gospel tradition, when you go to the earliest sources on the life of Jesus and his teaching, what you find is a Jesus that's more human than divine. And as time evolves, <clears throat> as time elapses, the picture of Jesus becomes bigger and bigger so that by the time you get to the gospel of John, Jesus is depicted as a preexistent divine being. You understand the objection? Do you understand what the objection is? In other words, if we take for granted that Mark 
is the first of the Gospels written, and John is the last of the four Gospels. What you see in Mark is not Jesus being portrayed as Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, as Holy Spirit anoints my mouth and gives me clarity of thought and speech to do justice to these topics. You find a semi-divine or a merely human Jesus that supernaturally, naturally, supernaturally Holy Spirit, loosen my tongue for the glory of Jesus. Supernaturally empowered human vessel of God. It's not until you get to the Gospel of John that you find Jesus depicted as a pre-existent, meaning a divine being who existed before he became human and the agent of creation. Right? This is an argument used by Muslims such as Shibri Ali and those who follow his example. Now, Bart Ehrman used to believe this, but Bart Ehrman has changed his position. He now admits that all the documents of the New Testament and all four Gospels do depict Jesus as God Almighty, but in different senses, in different ways. Yes, Stephen. But Bart Ehrman, Stephen Baptiste, does not believe that the Jesus of Mark is a pre-human divine being. In other words, he does not think that Mark portrays Jesus as having existed before he became flesh. Though Mark does portray Jesus as God in some sense, the sense in which he portrays Jesus as God is different from the way the Gospel of John does it. You with me there? Stephen Baptiste? <clears throat> Just want to make sure that though Ehrman admits all four Gospels depict Jesus as God, they don't do so in the same way. They depict Jesus as God, divine in some sense, but not in the same sense, right? He distinguishes between two main types of Christologies. You have the exaltation Christology, where Jesus is made God and equal to God in status, either at the baptism or the post-resurrection exaltation of Christ into heaven. And then you have what he calls incarnational Christology where Jesus existed before he became a flesh and blood human being as a divine being with the Father who then became man. Right? So everyone understand what Bart Ehrman is arguing for? And first class, as soon as you see an agent of Satan, a dog of Satan trying to distract, just block. So with that said, we're going to continue examining Luke and Acts along with Matthew. So let me continue from where I left off last night. We'll talk about Matthew again and then segue into Luke and Acts by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting the Holy Spirit to empower me to glorify Christ, bless you so we can fall more passion love with Jesus, right? And live for him more faithfully as the Lord blesses the internet connection as well. If you remember last night, we, we explained Matthew 28, 20. So let's start where I left off, and let me reiterate the point I made in last night's session, because whether we like it or whether we like it or not, folks, we are creatures of repetition. We have to hear things repetitively over and over again until, by the grace of God's Spirit, it becomes second nature, so we can recall that information and use it in our witness to glorify Christ. Right. So, even though you have heard this before and know this, be patient with others. And it doesn't hurt to hear it again because that's how we learn. God has designed us. That's what they did in school, right? When you went to school or your mother, she would teach you the alphabets or a teacher would teach you the alphabets over and over again by rote until it became second nature, right? And then when it sunk in and became instinctive, you're able to recall it and use it. <clears throat> Same thing with scriptures. In fact, the Bible describes the spiritual birth as natural birth. Just like you were born physically as a babe and had to mature, right? And as time went on, your brain matured, your intellect matured, right? Your thinking matured. The Bible describes being born again as spiritual birth. You're born as a spiritual babe, and in the beginning stages... The Holy Spirit administers to you milk, spiritual milk, until you mature to eating spiritual food, attaining full maturity, spiritually speaking, where you conform to the image of Christ completely and perfectly, right? 
So even your spiritual birth is likened to natural birth. So we need to hear things over and over again until by the grace of God's spirit, it becomes second nature, especially when, when we don't spend as much time in the word, as much time meditating on the word, as much time praying, singing, worshiping, applying, and spending more time being occupied by worldly things. Even that little thing we hear, by the time next week comes, we forget. Isn't that true? You go to church, you hear a sermon on Sunday. Within two days, you've forgotten 90% of the sermon. Because you're occupied by responsibilities, things of the world, family, job, <clears throat> you name it, you're occupied by it. So that's why you got to train yourself spiritually. That's why even the Bible describes your spiritual walk with Christ as spiritual training, spiritual discipline. Discipline, discipline yourself spiritually. Perform spiritual exercises. Praying is a spiritual exercise. Singing is a spiritual exercise. Hearing the word, meditating on it is a spiritual exercise, right? Preaching and teaching, evangelizing is spiritual exercise. And the more we exercise spiritually, the bigger our muscles become, spiritually speaking. Right? <clears throat> Fasting as well. Amen, friends. Serving others is also spiritual exercise. Visiting people in prison for the sake of Jesus. Visiting people in the hospitals for the sake of Jesus. Visiting orphans, caring for orphans. Visiting widows, caring for them. These are all spiritual exercises to help you to become spiritually mature until you attain the full measure in Christ, meaning that you become more like Jesus every day by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ. Right? Is that clear? My shirt keeps falling off because of the little box. Yep. You wonder why people come here to attack me when they don't understand they're going to get muzzled like dogs. Yeah, yeah, you see, again, tell me that's not satanic, demonic, that the devil is pricking their flesh, possessing their flesh to come here and attack, masquerading as Christians when they're actually sons of Belial. Amazing, right? But glory to Jesus Christ, that means we're doing something good when we get attacked this way from people pretending to be Christians, right? Thank you, friends. Keep praying. I get my health back, my good looks back, and to be holy and righteous and pure for the glory of Jesus. Okay, now with that said, let's continue. Let's start with Matthew 1, 21, 23. Now, guys, please pray the Holy Spirit guide me and to give you the ability to understand what I'm about to say because... You should be blown away, even though you heard it yesterday, and you may have heard it in previous sessions. It should still blow you away, the depth, the beauty, the majesty, the inspiration of the scriptures, and how all the scriptures testify beyond any reasonable doubt, Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit in respect to their essence. Okay, Matthew 1, 21 to 23. As the Lord loosens my tongue, read with me. We'll take 21 first. I should have just said 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now let's break that down. <clears throat> this is why you have to read attentively and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate you. Notice the angel gives the reason for the name Jesus. He explains to Joseph why you're going to call him Jesus. He says, call the child that the virgin will conceive and give birth to Jesus because of this reason. So the angel is giving, giving us the reason why the Son of God is called Jesus. And here's the reason. For he shall save his people from their sins. What's the connection with the name Jesus and Jesus' work of salvation? Because there's a connection. Call him this because he does this. What does he do? He personally, he himself has come. To save his people from their sins. That's why you give him this name. So let me repeat what the name means. Okay. Jesus' Hebrew name is Yeshua. Yeshua, if I transliterate it, is Y-E-S-H-U-A. Yeshua is the shortened form of Yehoshua. Yehoshua is where we get the word Joshua. Yeshua is the shortened form of the name Yehoshua, Y-E-H-O-S-H-U-A. 
That's where we get the word Joshua. Yehoshua, Yehoshua means Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. So notice what the angel says the name of the child will be. Name him Jehovah. Yahovah is salvation because he comes to save his people from their sins. In other words, Jesus is not simply a human agent that God uses. Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty coming to do what the Hebrew Bible says only Jehovah can do. Save Jehovah's people from their sins. Is that clear? Now, let's cross-reference Matthew 121 with Psalm 137 to 8. Matthew 121 with Psalm 130 verses 7 to 8. Watch here. It's going to get deeper if you just follow with me by the grace of God's Spirit. So, Matthew 121, and thank Protestant for serving me to serve you by posting verses. Matthew 121, then Psalm 130, verses 7 to 8. Guys, pay attention. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for because he shall save his people from their sins. He himself is doing the saving from sins. But now read Psalm 130, 7 to 8. Let Israel hope in Jehovah. Let Israel hope in Jehovah. For with Jehovah there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. Plentiful redemption. And he, Jehovah, pay attention, Yahovah, shall redeem Israel, who happens to be God's people, from all his iniquities. Wait, guys. The psalmist says it's Jehovah who saves Israel from all of Israel's sins. The angel says to Joseph, the child born from the virgin, he will be doing the same from sins. And the child will save his people from their sins. What's going on here? What's going on here, folks? Help me understand this. How can the child born of the virgin... Do what the Psalms and the Old Testament as a whole teach Jehovah does and only Jehovah. Jehovah and only Jehovah saves people from their sins, especially his people Israel. Is it sinking in? Before I move on? But then Psalm 130 makes it even more intriguing. Psalm 130 makes it even more intriguing. Because let's read Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. You got it, medic. Everyone's getting it. Glory to God. Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. If thou, Jehovah, O Yehovah, if you should mark iniquities, if you were to hold people accountable for their sins, O Lord, who will stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. Did you catch it? If you, Jehovah, call creatures into account for their sins, no one can stand before you. You would have to destroy every one of them. But there is forgiveness with you. You caught it? If Jesus is a mere flesh and blood creature, then he too would be a sinner needing Jehovah to redeem him. But instead, Jesus is the one doing the redeeming, doing the forgiving, doing the saving from sin. How is that possible? Did you guys catch it? Is it sinking in? Think about it, medic. No, I'm not the best. It's the triumph God who enables me and empowers me to do what I do, Alex. So give him the glory and pray for my preservation for the glory of Jesus. Okay? Okay, now. Think about it. Uh, here goes Hater Wood. Let me guess, Hater Wood. You're going to do another live stream from Israel. So you're going to take the 50 viewers I have and add them to the 2,000 that you got watching you. Okay. And by the way, Hater Wood, don't forget, huh? November 20, 20 22nd. It's on you, baby. You're going to bring me up because you're, you're, you know, Daddy Warbucks. You and George Soros got something going on. All right. Now. 
Medic, think about it. Are you listening, Medic? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Medic, think about it. We should do, be doing some live streams then. Okay, all right. Why should you fear Jehovah knowing that if Jehovah were to call you an account for your sins, he would destroy you righteously? He would destroy you and bring judgment upon you righteously because you would deserve it. So in asking the question, I answered it for you, medic. Knowing that God is all-powerful and there is no creature that can stop him if he wants to destroy anyone. And knowing that you deserve to be destroyed, but he chooses to show you mercy. Should you walk nonchalantly or with fear and reverence, knowing that this God can destroy you, but constrains himself and chooses to love you? You understand the point? Do you understand why it says you should fear him? Knowing he's almighty, and if you bring all creation together, he could wipe out the entire creation in a nanosecond, and there's no one that could stop him or resist him. And knowing that you deserve to be destroyed, yet instead of giving you what you deserve, he shows you mercy. This is a God that you need to be in awe of and fear that you don't mess with because you deserve to be destroyed, but he chooses to act in love and kindness, but don't mess with him. Exactly, Ron, here. Matthew 10, 28. In fact, here, let me show you what the king of Babylon, who because of God's disciplining him, brought him into repentance and salvation. Notice what he says. Daniel 4, 34 to 35. Exactly, Franz Toma. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Daniel 4, 34 to 35. Watch here. Daniel 4, 34, 35. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I bless the Most High. And I praise and honor him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Now, medic, everyone else, pay attention to verse 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. They're nothing to him. And he doeth, he does, according to his will, in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Did you catch it? There is no one who can say, what are you doing? Because he answers to no one. Right? Now let's look at Isaiah 40, verse 17. Isaiah 40, verse 17. All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. I didn't know there was something less than nothing, but the Bible says there's something less than nothing, and that's what we are in God's sight, meaning God doesn't need me, doesn't need you, doesn't need creation. He can wipe us out in a nanosecond, and there's no power that can stop him, and he would continue to be God in all his glorious majesty and infinitude. So the fact that he would even care about maggots like us, humble himself to enter creation and take on our nature and love us to the extent that he does, that's mind-blowing and humbling. In light of the fact he doesn't need us. You know what to do with Ong, right? Don't wait first and last. Thank you, brother. It makes you love him more, stand in more awe of him, and see how great is his love in light of the fact that you just read you are less than nothing because he doesn't need you at all. Clear? Matthew 10, 28. Matthew 10, 28. Even though you're less than nothing, Pedro, Jesus chose to love something that's less than nothing with an infinite love and chose to die to redeem something less than nothing so he wouldn't lose that less than nothing but have that less than nothing forever and ever in his presence. And though he doesn't need us. Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body. 
but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's who you should fear. Fear him because he can do it, but chooses not to. In fact, he even chooses to plead with you, beseech you, and beg you, don't make me destroy you. I don't. I don't want to destroy you. I want to save you. I want to bless you. I want to heal you. I want to love you. I want you to be flooded in my love. I want to drown you in my love. Why then do you keep provoking me to anger when I don't want to hurt you? That's the message of the Bible. Right? And one day I'll do an entire session on it because I don't want to go off topic right now. Right? Hebrews 10, 30 to 31. Hebrews 10, 30 to 31. And he even pleads with you. You know, you under, do you know you're gonna think I'm lying and exaggerating, but I'm gonna show you the scriptures. Hebrews 10, 30, 31. Let's read this and I'm gonna show it to you. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord, I will repay you for what you've done. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God if he's angry with you. Now, just to show you how amazing, mind-blowing the love of this God is, Father, Son, and Spirit. You know the Bible says that God actually pleads, begs, beseeches the world to turn to him because he aches to save the world and everyone in it. Do you know that? He actually pleads with you. You know that? Yeah, you don't believe me, Pedro? Let me prove it to you. Are you ready now for the proof? So someone says, oh, blasphemy. God forbid, I'm not blaspheming. I'm quoting Paul, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Hear the words of inspired scripture. God actually pleads and begs and beseeches the world to turn to him. Let me prove it to you. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 20. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 20. And you're no human being. You're a seven-headed seven dog, filthy dog of Satan. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20. Read. To wit, that God was in Christ. Pay attention. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Unto them. Now watch. Watch what Paul says. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ that be ye reconciled to God. See what he's saying? We are the ambassadors of Christ, and we're beseeching you, imploring you, begging you on God's behalf for the sake of God. God speaking through us to tell us, to tell you, be reconciled, please. catch it hit the like button you just read it pedro second corinthians 5 20 but start 19 you can actually start at 14 all the way to 21 do you see it paul is saying god is beseeching you through us we're his ambassadors and as his ambassadors he's telling me paul telling us today tell the world beseech the world implore the world beg the world be reconciled to Christ, please. You see that? So was I lying? Was I making it up? Hit that like button, folks. Was I lying? Was I making it up? Right? So, so now, you saw in Matthew 121, Jesus Christ is said to be Jehovah who comes to save his people from their sins. Now, folks, let that sink in. I don't know if it's sinking in. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. The very first chapter of Matthew already identifies Jesus as Jehovah of the Old Testament, doing what only Jehovah can do, save his people from their sins. That's the first chapter of Matthew. Can you imagine what else Matthew is going to go on to say about Jesus in the rest of the chapters? 
If he already starts chapter one by identifying Jesus as Jehovah who saves his people from their sins. Is that amazing? But let's break down 22 and 23. Matthew 1, 22 to 23. Matthew 1, 22 to 23. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now, I'm going to give you the link to the Greek interlinear. Here it is. And I'll explain this by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here you go. Here's the Greek interlinear. Okay. Click on this. Click on that. I want you to see what the Greek words for God is. Okay, Click on it. It's right here. Meth hemon ha theos. Meth hemon ha theos. The Erasmian butchering of Greek. With us, ha theos. Or as the Greek would say it, o theus, o theus, o theus. Meet, imun, o theus. All right. Do you see? It's ha theos, meaning the God. Not just a God or divine being, but the God has come to dwell with us. You understand what Matthew just said? The blessed mother of our Lord Jesus, the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Spirit and gave birth to a human baby while a sexual virgin. And that human baby is the God who comes to dwell with us. Wow. So you mean in the very first chapter of Matthew, Matthew identifies Jesus as Jehovah who comes to save his people from their sins as the very God, the God of heaven, who now has come into the world being born as a human baby. First chapter? Let me give you the link again. Is it sinking in or no? And you're telling me it's only the gospel of John that identifies Jesus as God Almighty? Life, keep using everything from here for the glory of Christ. Discard anything that's wrong. Okay. Are you with me there? Okay, but wait, wait, it gets better. How do we know? How do we know that Matthew is saying that the child himself, that babe who was born from the virgin, that human baby is in actuality Jehovah God and the flesh, that he is the God who comes to dwell with us. How do we know he's saying that? How do we know that's what Matthew's telling us? Because if you remember yesterday, I'm going to repeat it again today. If you remember yesterday, I'm going to repeat it again today. Okay. There is a literary feature, a literary device that's used by the New Testament authors called bookend. Guys, remember this, please, and let me know if you're getting confused or you're understanding. Also known as inclusio. Okay. What is an inclusio, a bookend? A bookend, inclusio, is a literary feature where the author ends his writing by repeating, reiterating a theme or a point that he made at the start of the writing. Okay. In other words... The author ends his book similarly to the way he started it. He begins his book by saying something that he reiterates, repeats at the end of the book. That's why it's called a book end or an inclusio. You understand this feature? I praise the Lord Jesus that God has put in your heart to like my style of teaching because, like I said, I'm not going to draw everyone. Not everyone's going to like my style. That's why we have different teachers with different giftings, drawing different people. And it's an honor to serve you and your husband, everyone here for the glory of Jesus. Okay, do you understand what a bookend is now? An inclusio, do you understand? A writer will end his book, his writing, by repeating, reiterating a point, a concept, a theme that he began with. Is that clear? Because now if it's clear, 
Let's show you Matthew's book end. Matthew 1.23 and Matthew 28.20 back to back. Matthew 1.23 and Matthew 28.20 back to back. Matthew 1.23 and Matthew 28.20. Yep, Riaz, 100%. Revelation does it as well. Let's see if you catch the bookend. Let's see, those of you who are astute by the grace of God's spirit, let's see if you catch the bookend. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Notice verse 20 of chapter 28, the last verse of Matthew. Jesus speaking now, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Did you catch the book end? Or Daryl Nutt, if you love me for the sake of Jesus, you're going to pray. Jesus destroys my flesh, keeps me humble, makes me holy and righteous and pure, in love with him, more patient with my brothers and sisters, and give myself more to Christ in blessing you, to provide for my needs and protect my children, save us from these trials, and also, if he's pleased, to confirm this decision regarding a godly companion, in Jesus' name. Anyway, and for the provisions. Did you guys see the bookend? Matthew 123 says, The virgin gave birth to a child, a son, and he is God with us. And then the, the gospel ends with Jesus saying, I, I myself, am with all of you to the end of the world. So is it clear from the bookend, from the conclusion of Matthew, that Matthew intends to describe Jesus himself as the God of heaven who comes to dwell with us and remain with us till the end of the age? So that is Jesus whom Matthew is calling Ha Theos, the God. Is it clear? No, he's not a distinct deity in the Trinity. There's only one deity in the Trinity. There's only one God, one deity, Rebecca. He's a distinct person in the Trinity. Is that clear? Everyone getting it? Everyone got it? So Jesus is saying, I will personally be with every one of you. Not physically. Physically is not here. His physical body is glorified in heaven. And he'll come down in that physical body at the end of the age. But personally, he's with us. Watching over us, sustaining us, guiding us, and preserving us. And he's with us in union with the Spirit. In other words, if you have the Spirit of Christ, then you have Christ with you and the Father with you. So... Did you see how much meat in just the first chapter of Matthew? In the first chapter of Matthew, Matthew has identified Jesus as Jehovah who saves his people from their sins and as the God of heaven, the God, Hathaos, coming to dwell with us, being born as a human baby from a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's just the first chapter, folks. Clear? Before I move on to the next point? Okay. If that's clear, then I want to go to Luke chapter 1 and see, does Luke do something similar? Does Luke do something similar in that he begins the gospel by identifying Jesus Christ as God Almighty. Okay? Are you ready for the meat in Luke? Are you ready for the meat in Luke? Let me know. And let me know if I'm, if I'm boring you. I don't want to bore you. I want to bless you and challenge you to fall more in love with the triune God. Okay. Before I go to Luke, let's go to Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 2. Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 2. <clears throat> Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 2. Okay, read with me, though. Please read. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon, and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. Pay attention. 
Galilee of the nations, Galilee of the Gentiles, beyond the sea, beyond Jordan. Don't forget, Galilee of the nations. But then notice verse 2. What's going to happen in Galilee? Galilee by the Jordan, what's going to happen? Read verse 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. So what's going to take place in Galilee in the future? A great light will shine to those who are living in darkness, right? Are you catching it? Are you catching it? Galilee of the nations, a great light shining on those who are in darkness. Okay. Let's see what Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, utters as he praises God upon the birth of his son, John. When John the Baptist was born, Zechariah's mute mouth was, was open, filled with the Holy Spirit. He breaks out in praise. And as he's praising God, he is alluding to, recalling all these Old Testament promises. Let's look at Luke 1, 78 to 79. First, before we do that, Luke 1, 67, and then jump to 78, 79. Luke 1, 67. Jump to 78, 79. Watch here. Let's see if you catch it. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Spirit, and prophesying, saying, pay attention, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? The language in 79? As the Holy Spirit fills Zechariah to utter these promises. Send this guy on his merry way. No, not Psalms, Irene. You guys didn't catch it. Let's try it again. Post Luke 1, 79 with Isaiah 9, 2. Luke 1, 79 with Isaiah 9, 2. You guys didn't catch it. It has nothing to do with the Psalms, Irene. To give light to them that sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way of peace. Isaiah 9, 2. The, the people that walk in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the sh land of the shadow of death upon them hath light shine. Are you not making the connection? What Zechariah is referring to as being fulfilled with the birth of John the Baptist and the coming of Jesus? Only light, Scott? What bookend? You guys are all confused. Oh, my goodness. You're going to kill me. I'm going to die of a heart attack to be with Jesus. What bookend, Rebel? Bookend takes place at the end of the book. What bookend? Let's try it again. Is anyone seeing what Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, is alluding to in Luke 179? Some of you saw it. Post it one more time. Luke 179, Isaiah 9, 2. Okay. Zechariah filtered, notice what he says in 79, to give light, notice what he says in 79, to give light to them that sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Now, notice Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Does anyone see the connection? Most of you got it. Why are you going to John 1? What does John 1, Michiel, have to do with Luke 1? Did everyone get that Zechariah, filled with the Spirit, is referring to Isaiah 9, 2 as being fulfilled at the birth of John the Baptist and the coming of Jesus? Are you seeing this or no? Someone's not seeing it, let me know. Who's not getting it? Everyone getting it? Okay, why is that important? Because Luke is introducing you in the very first chapter to the fulfillment of Isaiah 9. Okay, Isaiah 9. Now let's look at it in context. Luke is telling you, Luke 1, Jesus has come to fulfill Isaiah 9. Okay, now let's see. 
Let's look at it again. Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 2, and then 6 to 7. Now watch. Please pay attention. I want you to get it. I'll repeat it more than once until you get it. That's the whole point of these sessions. Isaiah 9, verse 1 to 2, 6 to 7. Notice where this light will shine, from where it will shine. Pay attention. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. It won't be completely dark and bring destruction because God is going to remove the dimness. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. Please remember Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shine. Galilee of the nations, light will shine, a great light. And what is the light? Verses 6 to 7. What is the light? 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born. Oh, the light that will be great that shines from Galilee is a child who is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, El Gibor, a child born who's the mighty God himself being born as a child who's the great light that shines from Galilee. The everlasting father, the prince of peace. And if you still don't get it, pay attention to seven. Pay attention to seven. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, upon David's throne, and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of Jehovah hosts will perform this. Okay. Before I show you the fulfillment, now Luke 1. Isaiah 9 says, A great light will shine from Galilee of the nations. What is a great light? A child that will be born. This child will be born, who is a son given, and this child is the mighty God. Hebrew, El Gibor. God the mighty. Being born to sit on the throne of David forever. Don't come back, Duhawi. Stay with CP. We don't need someone like you. It's okay, Rebo. You with me there? You got it? So, folks, what's the great light that will shine from Galilee? A child who will be born. And that child is the mighty God being born as a baby to sit on David's throne. Clear? You're getting it? Lisa, how come you come and do hit and run? You come, listen, then you leave me. All by my theme. Is it clear? You sure? Galley of the nations, a great light, a child born, sits on David's throne, who's the mighty God. You sure you got it? Let's see if you got it. Let's go now to Luke 1, 26 to 33. Let's see if you got it. Luke 1, 26 to 33. Let's see if you got it. Let's see. Tell me what angel Gabriel is alluding to when he speaks to Mary. Watch. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee. He went to a city of Galilee named Lazarus, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. 29. Wait, this gets better. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. For thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. A child will be born, a son is given, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, a great light shining from Galilee, a great light. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Wait, he sits on David's throne. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom shall there be no end. What? Let's look at Isaiah one more time. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. One more time. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. One more time. Isaiah 
For unto us a child is born, a son is given. Whose son? The son of the highest. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. Amen. Now let's look at Luke 1, 32, 33 again. Luke 1, 32, 33. Luke 1, 32, 33. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever, and his kingdom shall be in him. Wait, 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 wait. You're telling me angel Gabriel is announcing to Mary, you are the woman who's going to conceive a child, give birth to a son who fulfills Isaiah 9. Your virgin-born son is that child who'll be born, the son who'll be given, who is a wonderful counselor, the mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, who sits on David's throne? Yes. So is it a coincidence that Mary is in Galilee? Luke 1, 26 to 27. You got it, Rebecca. Isaiah gives us the prophecy, and Luke records its fulfillment. Luke 1, 26 to 27. The sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from David unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Did you catch what happened to Luke 1? Or no? Okay. You understand what Luke 1 just did? Luke told you in Luke 1, Jesus fulfills Isaiah 9. But the child born, the son given in Isaiah 9, is no mere creature. He's the mighty God in the flesh. The mighty God who becomes a human baby born from a virgin. Okay, now, let me prove to you this child born is Jehovah God in the flesh. Let's look at Isaiah 9, verse 6, and Isaiah 10, 20 to 21. Isaiah 9, verse 6, and Isaiah chapter 10, verses 20 to 21. Isaiah 9, 6, pay attention. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Notice, he's called the Mighty God. Now watch Isaiah 10, 20 to 21. Isaiah 10, 20 to 21. Guys, the same phrase, El Gibor, Mighty God. Notice, Isaiah 10, 20 to 21. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon, lean, depend on Jehovah, Yahovah, the Holy One of Israel in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. Guys, did you catch it? The child born is called the mighty God. Jehovah is called the mighty God. Now do me a favor, post Isaiah 9, 6 and Isaiah 10, 21 back to back. Isaiah 9, verse 6 and Isaiah 10, 21 back to back. No, young Moses, because I already did a session on my YouTube channel on what it means for Jesus to be everlasting father. And I wrote an article on what it means for Jesus to be everlasting father. Go and read the article and watch the session. Okay, read with me again. The child born is a son given. He's the mighty God. Read it, mighty God. But then Isaiah 10, 21, Jehovah is the mighty God. Child is born, he's the mighty God, El Gabor. Jehovah, he's the mighty God. But wait, in Isaiah 43, 10 to 11, I'm told there is no other God besides Jehovah. Isaiah 43, 10 to 11. There is no other God besides Jehovah. Isaiah 43, 10 to 11. 
You are my witnesses, saith Jehovah, and my servant whom I've chosen that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God form, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am Jehovah, Yehovah, and beside me there is no Savior. Isaiah 45, 5 to 6. Isaiah 45, 5 to 6. I am Jehovah, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am Jehovah, there is none else. Okay, Isaiah, I'm confused. Wait, wait. Jehovah is the mighty God, yes. So there is no other mighty God beside Jehovah, right? Yeah. But the child born is also the mighty God. And he's distinct from Jehovah. Yeah? So if Jehovah is the mighty God and the child is the mighty God and there is no other mighty God besides Jehovah, are you telling me that Je the child is also Jehovah? Yes, he's Jehovah in the flesh, Jehovah being born as a baby. But he's also distinct from Jehovah. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm. I see. Now, just in case you want to see, it's the same phrase in Hebrew, El Gibor, the mighty God. Here you go. Let me give you the interlinear to the Hebrew. Here you go. I know I got a bunch of skeptics. They don't believe what I got to say. Here you go. Go to Isaiah 9, verse 6. Can you tell me whether the Hebrew is El Gibor? Exactly, Alex. Can you click on the link and tell me whether the child is El Gibor? Can you click on the link and tell me whether child is called El Gibor? Two words, God the Mighty. Exactly, Alex. That means Isaiah portrays Jehovah at least two divine persons. Jehovah and the child born, the Messiah, who's God in the flesh. Can you confirm that the child is called El Gibor? I gave you the link. Let me give it to you again. Do you see it? Everyone see it? Okay. For those of you who already see it, here's Isaiah 10.21. Isaiah 10.21. Here's the link. It's BibleHub.com, the interlinear provided by BibleHub.com, an excellent online resource. Use it. Go there. Can you tell me whether Jehovah is called El Gibor? There's the link. Whether Jehovah is called El Gibor. Can, are you guys confirming it? Does everyone see? The child born in Isaiah 9, 6 is El Gibor. Jehovah in Isaiah 10 is El Gibor, El Gibor. And yet, Isaiah says there is no other God besides Jehovah. The child is distinct from Jehovah, but with Jehovah, he happens to be El Gibor, the mighty God. And you're telling me the Old Testament doesn't proclaim God's triunity. Is it everyone getting it now? So, folks, here's my question. Here's my question for those of you listening, following along. If in Luke chapter 1, Luke has already described Jesus as the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 9, because Zechariah filled the Holy Spirit alludes to Isaiah 9, verse 2, in Luke 179. And then Angel Gabriel alludes to Isaiah 9 in announcing to Mary that she's going to conceive and give birth as a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit to that child in fulfillment of Isaiah 9. You're telling me that Luke does not think that Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh? So... You're telling me it's only in the Gospel of John where Jesus is identified as Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, but Luke doesn't describe him as God Almighty in the flesh. Matthew doesn't describe him as God Almighty in the flesh. And wait till we get to Mark. You're going to be blown away by Mark as well. So do you see clear, irrefutable proof from Matthew and Luke and Acts, in the previous sessions, that these writers, inspired by the Spirit, Portray Jesus as Jehovah God of the Old Testament, 
who now appears as a flesh and blood human being. Are you getting it? I am going to do John 1, God willing. This is all in preparation for John 1, medic. Oh, yeah. You're going to be blown away, I promise you. If after you hear these series and still end up denying the Trinity or walking away from the faith, then I'm telling you, you deserve the judgment that will fall upon you because God is now giving you irrefutable proof. The Bible is his word. God is real, and Jesus is God in the flesh, your only hope of salvation. You guys are getting meat by the grace of God's spirit. And if you still turn away and reject the Lord, you deserve what you get. I deserve what I get. We have no excuse. But in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we will never turn away. We will be kept for the glory of Christ. Right? Now, let me really blow you away. Let me really blow you away. Amen. May the Lord Jesus hear your prayer for all of us. You really want to get blown away with Luke 1? You really want to get blown away? Thank you, friends. Provide for me, save me, keep me holy in love with him. Holy and in love with Jesus. And friends, pray that the Lord will give me that confirmation about that godly partner. Okay? All right, now. You really want to be blown away? Luke 1, 41 to 44. Luke 1, 41, 44. Guys, this is where I want you to just pay attention. Get blown away. Be humbled and moved in your spirit. This is why people think I'm becoming Catholic or Orthodox. It's not. I'm being biblical. Watch. Watch this. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, she heard Mary's voice. The babe leaped in her womb. John was six months pregnant in Elizabeth's womb. He was six months old in the womb. Okay? He leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice what she says. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou, you, you are blessed among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Side note, folks. Did you know... No one told Elizabeth, no human agent, no human creature told Elizabeth that Mary was pregnant. Do you know why? Because Mary had just gotten pregnant recently, and no one knew but Mary and the angel that she was pregnant. But here, so that Mary would have no doubt, pay attention here. God is now giving supernatural confirmation to Mary. You are not hallucinating, Mary. You did see an angel, and you are pregnant with the eternal son of God in your womb. You did conceive the human nature, the physical body of God's beloved son in your womb by the spirit. And I'm going to prove it to you. Elizabeth will greet you and tell you that you're with child. Something Elizabeth could not have known if God didn't make it known to her. Third party confirmation. Because Mary just walked in. Elizabeth, how do you know I'm pregnant? No one knows but me. Because I saw the angel. The same angel told me that you're coming. You're pregnant with my Lord, my Savior, my God, and I greet you. Let's look at it again. Luke 1, 42 to 43. Let's post Luke 1, 42, 43, 44. Watch here. Watch here. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Now here's where it touches me. Here's where it moves me. 43 and 44. And whence is this to me? What honor is this to me? The mother of my Lord should come to me. Elizabeth, yes. Mary just conceived, maybe less than a week. Jesus is less than a week old in his mother's womb. And already, Jesus is Elizabeth's Lord. And notice the honor. What honor that the mother of my Lord would come to me. The mother of my Lord. You're carrying my Lord in your womb. My Lord dwells in your womb. My Lord tabernacles in your womb. And what an honor his mother comes to see me. But watch this, 44. You didn't post 44, Protestant. 44. Watch here. 
44. For lo, as soon as the voice, as soon as your voice, pay attention, as soon as the voice, I'm about to cry, man, honestly, this moves me. May the Holy Spirit purify my motives, never to do it for praise of men. Okay, watch. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation, as soon as I heard your greeting, the salutation entered my ears, the sound of your voice penetrated into my womb, and the babe John leaped in my womb for joy. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Even an unborn baby in the womb recognized the voice, the sound of the mother of his Lord and was excited. John in his mother's womb rejoiced that he heard the sound of the mother of his God and Savior. And you tell me this is not mind-blowing? Medic, this is confirming for you what happened yesterday. Yes, it's only about a week. She had just received the Annunciation, Rebecca, and went to Elizabeth to confirm why. Why did she do that? Let me show you why did Mary right away leave to see Elizabeth. Luke 1, 36 to 40. Exactly, friends. Shame on them for making the mother of our Lord less. We don't make her too much. She's not a goddess. She's a creature. But she's the most beautiful of all creatures, the most exalted, because she's saved by Jesus and his mother. Now watch here. Luke 1, 36 to 40. Read with me. Luke 1, 36 to 40. And behold, thy cousin, the angel Gabriel is telling Mary. Watch this. Gabriel is telling Mary. Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she also has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her. She's six months pregnant. The one who couldn't have any children. She's six months pregnant, Mary. She who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Now notice what happens. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. I am his handmaid, his servant. Be it, up, be, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now notice what she did. And Mary arose. Lord Jesus, rebuke Satan by the power of your blood, the fire of your Holy Spirit. Oh, boy. Okay. Okay, now notice Luke 139. And Mary in those days... Rose in those days, she got ready, she prepared the stuff, and went into the hill country with haste, into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. You see why she did it? You see why Mary went to Elizabeth's home? Because she wanted to confirm for herself, was, was I dreaming? Am I hallucinating? Did I really receive the word that I'd be given the honor of conceiving in my womb God Almighty in the flesh? God will enter my womb and become my son by the power of the Holy Spirit while I'm a virgin. No man touch me. Or am I hallucinating? Well, let me go and see. And she entered. And as she entered, Elizabeth said, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. You were not hallucinating. The angel did come to you as he came to me. And look, Mary, I am six months pregnant because my son, will be the forerunner for your son. And your son is my Lord and your Lord and my son's Lord. Catch it? You catch it or no? Is it sinking in? Before I move on? Is it sinking in? Yep. Now let me explain to you the significance. This shows you that God is giving supernatural confirmation for Mary. You're not hallucinating. You did see an angel. You are now pregnant with the mighty God, El Gibor, the everlasting father. He's now in your womb to become human. Number two, these passages destroy abortion and show that it's murder. Notice Jesus is already Elizabeth's Lord even though he's only been conceived about a week, showing from God's perspective, from conception is where life begins. And John is six months old in his mother's womb, and as a six-month unborn child, 
He can discern the voice of the mother of God and rejoice, meaning that even children in the womb can discern sounds, which medically has been confirmed now. Did you know that? Medically, it's confirmed that a baby already discerns and identifies the sound of her, her or his mother. You get it? But beyond that, here's my question for every one of you. Here's my question. We already saw that in Luke 1, Jesus is the fulfillment. Uh, brother, give me a minute. I'll call you back. Hang on. Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah 9, right? In Luke 1. Luke 1, Jesus fulfills Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 2, 6 to 7, where a great light will shine from Galilee of the nations. And that great, great light happens to be a child who'll be born, who's a son given, who's the mighty God, a title for Jehovah, showing that child born is God Almighty in the flesh, right? We established that, right? We established that Luke 1 has presented Jesus as the mighty God of Isaiah 9. Okay. So let me ask you a question. Zechariah knew that Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah 9 because he alludes to it. Mary was told she'll conceive and give birth to the child of Isaiah 9. Elizabeth was already told that's who Mary will be, the mother of that child of Isaiah 9, the mighty God. So in light of that, when Elizabeth says to Mary, mother of my Lord, did she mean you're the mother of my king only or you're the mother of my Lord? And the reason why he's my Lord, because he's my God. That child in you is my God, who's now becoming flesh. So when she calls her the mother of my Lord, that's simply another way of saying the mother of my God. What is she saying? Mother of my Lord, meaning just my king, my master, or mother of my Lord, meaning the God of the Old Testament, the mighty God is in your womb. You're the mother of my Lord in that that child is my God. It is the second one. There's no way around this, contrary to any Protestant, even though I am Protestant in many areas. She's saying, the mother of my Lord, meaning the mother of my God. Therefore, Orthodox and Catholic are right. Orthodox and Catholic are right. She is the mother of God. You get it now? She is the mother of God. You see how much meat we impact from Luke 1? Want to do this? Let me just do this real fast. Okay. You see how much meat? Yeah, Mary's only human. She's the mother of God in that she gave. The mighty God, his physical body, and human nature. Now, do you see how much meat? What else did you see? You saw how Luke 1 destroys abortion and shows that it's evil, it's murder. Because from God's perspective, the child conceived in the womb is a human life from conception. That's what God says, end of story. Abortion is murder. We condemn it to the pit of hell in Jesus' name. Why should we accept Catholicism? Just because something is true that Catholics agree with doesn't mean all of Catholicism is true. Don't make that foolish mistake, sister. Hafsa, you thought wrong because you were poisoned by Islam and Muhammad because that's what Islam teaches. A baby is a life from conception. That's what the Bible teaches. And you better fight for the right of the child the moment it's conceived in the womb. You fight for the right of the unborn child. You are their voice. Oh, sorry, Angela, I didn't know that. Is that clear? So you see the point, right? 
Did we just provide irrefutable proof from Matthew 1 and Luke 1 that both these authors, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, because we believe they're inspired, identify Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, distinct from the Father and the Holy Spirit? Distinct from the Father and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I don't know if she's With me there? Is that clear? Is that clear? Matthew 1, Luke 1, clearly present Jesus as Jehovah God of the Hebrew Bible, who became born as a baby from his blessed virgin mother. Because they both affirm the virginal conception and birth of the Lord Jesus from Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. They both do. Matthew 1, 18 and 1, 20. Let's look at it. Matthew 1, verse 18 and verse 20. And Luke 1, 34, 35. Matthew 1, verse 18, verse 20. And Luke 1, verses 34 to 35. Well, you, you won't need to forget it, Cass. It's now archived. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Re-listen to these videos. Pass them on to others. Bless them. Okay. Matthew 1, 18 and 20. Now, the birth of Jesus, Christ was on this wise, in this manner. When, as his mother, Mary, was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Ghost. She was found child from the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1, 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Luke 1, 34, 35. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So not only did she conceive while a virgin, she gave birth while she was still a virgin. Matthew 1, 24, 25. Matthew 1, 24, 25. Matthew 1, 24, 25. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had been her and took unto him his wife. Now notice 25. Matthew is clear. And knew her not, did not touch her physically at all till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. So let me hammer this point. You are not a Christian, but a son or daughter of Satan. If you deny Mary conceived Jesus and gave birth to Jesus while a sexual virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit, no man having touched her. If you deny this, you are a dog of Satan. You're not my brother and sister. Have nothing to do with me. All right? Clear? No, he chose her out of his own free will, just like he chooses us for his glory. Okay, now, let me now blow your minds away, because I may mention one other point, or we'll do part four. Which we'll do part four, God willing, but I don't know if I bring up another point, but here's what I want you to think about. Yep, tribe of Judah. Here's what I want you to think about. Think about this. Since Matthew and Luke portrays Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty, and because he's Jehovah God Almighty, that means he's the creator, sustainer, life giver of all creation, which means he created everything on earth, which means Jesus created his mother and gives her life. Now, let me break that down. Jesus is the only human being in history who can say, I'm older than my mother, and I even created her and chose her to be my mother. He's the only one who can say, I chose who my parents would be, and I'm older than my parents, and I gave them life and created them to be my parents. Sink in. Did, you, did it sink in or no? Jesus is the eternal son, one with the Father and the Spirit. That means at a point in time, Father, Son, and Spirit came together and said, it's now time to create the human mother 
of the Messiah. And they created and fashioned her in her mother's womb. And then when she came out of her mother, Jesus in heaven is watching that young baby and saying, that's my future mother. And he's watching her, overseeing her, protecting her, preserving her from all harm until the day comes and he says, it's time for me to enter her womb. It moves me in my heart, <clears throat> actually. It moves me. Not only he knew, he created her. It's not he knew. He created her to be his mother. It moves me in my heart because that means from heaven, the Son of God, creator of heaven and earth, one with the Father and Spirit, was watching over that young woman. And I can only imagine the conversations in heaven, right? Saying, Father, there she is. There goes my future mother. Holy Spirit, that's the one. That's the one that you're going to soon come upon. And cause her to conceive my physical body, my human, na human nature. That's the one. There she goes. There goes my beautiful mother. And I made her beautiful. Wow. Yes, King. See, you moved me in my spirit right there. King of Kings, you said it most eloquently. Her very life was created for this purpose. Her very life... <laughs> was created for this. She was specially created to be the mother of our God and Savior in the flesh. See? And you tell me this woman isn't special? How can you not help but fall in love with her? No, she's not considered a prophetess, no. Nowhere. The Bible doesn't call her that. She's greater than that. She's the mother of the eternal Son of God, God in the flesh. That makes her much better and greater than a prophet. I'm going to share something with you. And we'll end it. We'll do part four because I don't want to go into other uh, topics. Here. Here is my hope and my desire and my heart. That if the Lord comes now, now, or if I die, that by his grace, by his righteousness, by his blood, which is my hope and I trust in, I will enter his presence. And the first thing I'll be allowed to do is bow before his feet, hold his feet, kiss his feet, kiss the feet of Jesus, the physical feet, because he's in his physical body. And just tell him, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saving a wretch like me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for even using me to glorify you. I love you, Lord Jesus. I love you. And then after that, this is my dream. The other person I want to see right afterwards, and I mean this from my heart. I'm not just saying in front of you. I want to see his mother. I want to see the woman that carried my Lord in her womb. Look at her and say, would you hold me too? And embrace me. I want I want to you to embrace me as you embrace Jesus. And the third person I want to see. Third person I want to see after that. I want to see Paul. I want to see him and say, Paul, it is an honor for me to be counted as one of your brothers because you are my hero. That's what I want to do. First, Jesus, my Lord. And then I want to see his blessed mother and tell her, I love you. I love you. I love you more than my mother. I do. I love you more than my mother because you're the mother of the one whom I love more than anything. You're the mother of my Savior. And because of that, you're my mother. Then I want to look at Paul and say, I love you. You are my hero. Thank Jesus for you. That's what I want to do. Okay, folks. Hold on, let's wait for the Father, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the Father, the Holy Spirit. It's not me, Michaela. It's the triune God, Father, the Holy Spirit, who makes us cry, right? Because he's beautiful. Folks, I'm going to end it here, this session. Lord willing, tomorrow, unfortunately, it's Halloween and people are celebrating it. I won't be around till Friday, God willing. Look for me Friday, God willing. I'm going to do part four. But in the meantime, can I ask you to do something for me? Don't stop praying for me. Don't stop praying for my angels. 
Don't stop praying for my vindication that God gives me perfect vindication from the courts. Keeps me here in this state. Does not allow me to be sent back. To give me favor here. To keep providing financially. If you guys believe God has called me. If you guys believe God has called me to full-time ministry. Pray that God will raise up more people to partner with me regularly. To do the work for his glory. And I want to thank. I have in fact. Few people have joined this week contributing. You know who you are. You're rewarded with Jesus. I want to thank you and bless you that in spite of my imperfections, you still want to partner with me. Thank you. This helps me to do the work of the Lord and make sure my needs are taken care of and my daughter's needs. Pray for that. Pray that I can be holier and more like Christ to get healthier, to find a place sooner than later, and pray for this, right? God's will be done. If you want celibacy, so it be. But I do feel in my heart there may be someone. Ask the Lord to show me if I'm right and to make it clear to that other person as well, right? He knows who it is, and I just trust you with that. Pray in Jesus' name. And remember, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again because he is Yehovah, Jehovah, God Almighty, El Gibor, the mighty God, <clears throat> the God of heaven who became flesh to dwell with us and remains with us Till the end of the age, to the glory of God the Father. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We love you. Preserve us for your glory and never let us go. Preserve my daughters and fight for them. In Jesus' name. Love you guys. God bless you. Christ is risen, risen indeed.